I think most of us find ourselves in deep waters so much of the time. And I know that the news this week and last week has been so distressing. It just hits very close to home for any of us who have children in school or teachers that we know. Um, such a crazy, uncertain place that we live in. And then the people in this family, our faith family, <coughs> there are difficult things going on. We are in deep waters. If you would like to join me at the front of the altar, this is the perfect time to come and pray. Um, you notice some of our staff is not here today. They're sick. We've got a lot of family members who are sick today also. Um, people traveling. People undergoing medical issues. Uh, so many reasons like, that make us feel like we're drowning. And God is faithful. So this morning, let us lift our eyes to the one who controls the wind and the waves. Let us pray. Gracious Father, when we feel like we're drowning, help that to be a reminder for us to look to you. When we can't breathe because of the pain. That's the strongest reminder that we can have. That we only breathe with your grace, with your strength, with your love and mercy. And so, Father, we thank you for the goodness that you've given us in our lives, the promises, the grace. But, Lord, we need you. We need help. We are needy people. We are imperfect and incomplete without you living in control of our lives. And so, Father, this morning, we place ourselves in your hands because we know that your love is perfect when everything around us is not. And so, God, thank you for that. Lord, I pray especially for my cousin Becca and her husband Russell who pastor a church in Uvalde, Texas. This morning, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like for them and their community. But we pray that your presence would be so very strong for all of the believers that can surround the hurting people. God, we know that when things are dark, your light shines the brightest. And Father, may it be so. May your light shine brightly in our darkness, in the darkness of, of the places that are just hurting so much. They don't know how to manage another day. And so, Lord, I pray that whatever, whatever it is that you put on our hearts that we can do to show your love and grace to the people around us, that you would help us to see that, that you would help us to be bold and to take that step, to open that hand, to open our hearts and our eyes to see around us. Because, God, you are so much bigger than our problems. And remind us once again. And thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to pray. We thank you for the safe place that we are experiencing right now. And we thank you for the promise of something more than what we can see and hear in front of us. For all of these things, God, and so much more, we say thank you. And beloved, let us all say amen and amen together. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <sighs> words. Have you ever tried to go a whole day without using any words? I've tried to go a whole day without hearing any. <laughs> words are kind of important. We're going to talk about words this morning and other things. We're going to try a little exercise right now. I will say a phrase and you finish it. Yes, you get to speak out loud. A stitch in time. Stitch Oh, this second knows the answers. What's wrong with you guys? Wake up. Okay. Eeny, meeny. I don't know. Isn't that special? I can tell who watches Saturday Night Live. Rockabye baby. I pledge allegiance. See? You guys know words. Words.
words are important, and they're important in our worship. There's a type of debate going on in many of our churches right now, these days, regarding how we worship. The ways that we approach doing our God business. Many of us grew up in, or are comfortable with the style of worship that we grew up with, that we're familiar with, um, or what the first kind of worship was that we experienced when we started going to church or were called to be a part of God's people. Part of the debate is what we would call high church versus low church, air quotes. High church versus low church. That's for my daughter, she hates air quotes. Okay, what do I mean by that? Those of us who have visited a Catholic or Episcopal or Presbyterian or Lutheran church have participated in a ex worship experience that we would call high church. And those of us who are more familiar with what we do here, you know, kind of wandering around and people get up and go get a drink or whatever, we would call this low church because it doesn't seem to be as scripted. More scripted services versus less scripted services. I have mentioned before how growing up in the Presbyterian Church, we would have worship folders that were about eight pages long. Seriously. You're welcome, Melissa. <laughs> that we don't have to print those here. And I would follow along the worship service, calculating how much longer I thought the service would take, you know, by where we were in the worship folder. Yep, okay, some of you are nodding your head. You, know, you understand what I'm saying, okay. Um, what high church versus low church really means is more active participation from the congregation versus less active participation, less congregational participation. There's a word for how we do church, and that is called liturgy. It literally means work of the people. And I was hoping Matt would be here this morning because he always critiques me and nods his head or shakes his head if I get stuff right or wrong. So, and he's sick this morning, so I will have to just go on my own steam. So whether our traditions are called high church or low church, it is liturgy, no matter which kind, because it's what we are doing. Whether it's scripted or not scripted, it's still called liturgy because it's us being here and worshiping. Did you know that the Nazarene denomination was birthed from a high church tradition? Yes. Yes, it was. For those of you who are familiar with the history of the Church of the Nazarene, you might be a little confused because you know that we kind of came out of the Methodist denomination, which most of us don't think of as a high church tradition, right? In America, it's not very scripted. However, our birthright is a very rich one, full of meaning and traditions and rituals. Steve and I have been blessed to travel, and on one of our journeys, we worshipped at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. It's a famous landmark, but it's also an active church. They celebrate the, the Lord's Day year-round. And when we were there, we drug all of our kids to church there on a Sunday morning and participated by drug, I mean, yeah. We will go to church on vacation. And we participated in a high church service with all the smells and bells. If you've not been to an Episcopal or Church of England service, it's very, very celebratory, ceremonial, lots of stuff going on. Um, the classical music was from an enormous pipe organ. I don't know how many hundreds of pipes there were. It was literally, you know, like four or five keyboards. I don't know how anybody could do that. Um, and we stood in a long, long line, hundreds of people to celebrate communion, to receive the sacraments, drinking from the same cup. And it was real wine. I, you know, you can look at me all you want, but it was communion. And uh, we were trusting God to kill all the foreign germs. And we heard a sermon from the Bishop of Kenya. Yes, it was a little hard to understand him because of his accent, but sad to say how shocked we were to hear a glorious holiness sermon in the middle of all this antique grandeur in high church. So what am I trying to say? We are saved and transformed by faith. Yes, we are. 
But God has given us guidelines for our behaviors. And liturgy is one way that we can participate in the divine dance with God. God gave his people special instructions to help us, to help us remember, to help us be a part of, to help us learn. We use rituals, and our rituals can involve special music, special words, special times. Think of a wedding ceremony. Most of you know many of the phrases and the, much of the music that is frequently seen or experienced during a wedding ceremony, right? Um, these things help us to make memories that are part of our worship, the rituals, and, and they come back to our minds to help us remember things, right? And music, music evokes memories. In my family, whenever we hear The Entertainer by Scott Joplin, we all go, oh, because one of my girls played it in sixth grade, I think, maybe fifth and fifth and sixth grade, um, probably 10, 11,000 times. I, I, we don't know. We don't know. It was in grade. It's like the walls remember that song. So whenever we'd hear it, we'd say, can you play something else? Please play something else. Can you play it a little slower, maybe? Because she played it at the speed of light. It's just, oh, can you play it inside your head, honey? <laughs> I, and I don't remember a single thing about the movie Jurassic World. But when we went to see it, when I heard the theme music from Jurassic Park, and yes, Roger, I know it's a different composer, a different conductor. Um, but it's the same theme. But when I heard that theme, what I saw in my, my head and what I felt and remembered was sitting on the bandstands, watching my children's high school bands do their routines to the theme of Jurassic Park, because it was, it was great music for that era. And music, it, it erased the movie that was in front of me and brought back the memories that I had, because the, the memories for me were emotional, watching my children, right? Um, and my girls can still all sing the Helping Verbs song. Really fast. Do you, do you not know that song? No. Ask Catherine to sing it after church. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of those things. Music is one of those things that helps you memorize and keep stuff in your brain, right? And there's other things that help us remember also. Um, although we can do some things without thinking automatically, how many of you think about how to ride a bike? Or how to drive your car. It's kind of scary sometimes because I think, oh my goodness, I don't remember turning there and here I am home. Right? Okay, right? We do this. Um, playing sports. My Spanish teacher, for some reason, talked about football a lot. And he talked about um, hearing the footsteps and muscle memory. If you do something over and over and over, you have the memory pathways for those things. Now, that means it can become rote. It is rote, but that's not always a bad thing. I'm going to talk about that more in a little bit. Okay, we need to remind ourselves of the meanings of some of these things. Words invoke memories, and some of you remembered certain things when I gave you half of a phrase a minute ago. Some of the memories that I come up with that it, words can evoke for me. There's a particular poem that my family recites every Thanksgiving. We stand around in a circle. It begins, friends, all friends, as years go by. Words are important to us and the way we use them. There are certain psalms Pastor Andy talked a little bit about Psalm 136. We're going to talk about that more in a few minutes. But there's a set of psalms, Psalms 120 through 134 in your Bible. So I'm going to ask you to get your Bibles out in a minute. So go ahead and get ready. Um, these song, songs, these psalms are called the Songs of Ascent. Psalm means song, right? What these songs would mean to the pilgrims as they were traveling is they were traveling together to Jerusalem. They would be in a group, everybody walking together, all together, year after year after year, and they would sing these songs as they walked. 
So those psalms would have a very special meaning to them. It would mean to them that they were walking towards a special time of worship. They were with their friends and their family. They were repeating something that was important to them. But they were together, and they're doing it. And so that was liturgy, right? It was a form of worship for them. It was purposeful and a special way for them to worship and thank and praise and bless God as they traveled closer and closer to their destination. This morning we're going to visit a passage from the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah that shows us a clear picture of how God's people spent their time in worship. Go ahead and find Nehemiah in the Old Testament. It's kind of close to Psalms. We're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 9. If you want to look at it on your phone, that's fine. I will extend grace to anybody who has their phone in front of them. But Nehemiah chapter 9. We are not going to read the whole chapter because there are 38 verses. And I know that you would tune me out long before we were done. But we're going to be talking about the whole chapter. I'll be summarizing it, pulling little pieces out. And I want you to check up on me and check in with me as we talk about this. Okay? When we find God's people here in Nehemiah chapter 9, they have returned from their captivity in Susa, which was the capital city of the Persian Empire, which would be modern-day Iran. When they returned to their beloved city, Jerusalem, they discovered that it was all torn down. It was in disarray. It was in ruins. And Nehemiah was given the job of overseeing, rebuilding the city. And that's where they are when we start our sermon this morning. What we see God's people doing here in Nehemiah chapter 9 in worship is their posture. And I'll get into a few of the details with giving you the verses in a minute. Their posture, what are they doing? They're all standing. I don't ask you to stand through the whole worship service. Are you glad? I do. I stand. That's okay. Okay. And they're confessing. They're confessing their sin. Now, they were standing for a quarter of the day. How long is that? Well, a whole day is 24 hours. They're not standing for six hours. But they're probably standing for three or four hours. And they're, they're, then they're confessing for a quarter of the day. That's a lot of confessing. They're reading from God's word. They're blessing God. They're reminding God of what God did for their fathers, for their family. And there's a commitment. All those things. Now look at verses 1 and 2. The first thing we read is the people's posture. On the 24th day of this month, the people were assembled. They fasted, wore funeral clothing, and had dirt on their heads. The dirt on their heads is a sign of mourning. They were grieving. Their hearts were broken. And that's what the dirt would symbolize. After the Israelites separated themselves from all the foreigners, they stood to confess their sins and the terrible behavior of their ancestors. So posture, our posture is important. When we come into God's presence purposely, intentionally, where we are this morning, what posture do we take? Are we reluctant? Mom, Dad made me come. I wouldn't be here. Are we too tired? Late Saturday night or a too, too, too busy weekend? Are we reliving a moment that we wish had not happened over and over in our mind? Are we anticipating, what do I have to do this week? Are we thinking about what we didn't finish yesterday or what we're going to do tomorrow or what do we want to eat for lunch after church? That's the conversation we usually have in the car on the way here. Whether we stand or we sit or we kneel, our emotional and our spiritual posture must be to face God with all that we are or hope to be. That's our posture when we come to worship. Let us bring our hearts and our minds and our hands and our feet captive into God's presence. 
The next thing that we see God's people doing is confessing in verse 3. They stood in their place and read the instruction scroll from the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of the day, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Confessing. How easy is it to say out loud the things that are troubling us? Those things for which we are deeply, grievously sorry. Even those things over which we have no control. I didn't do it. Not me. In Nehemiah chapter 9, God's people realized that even though they had no responsibility for the actions of their ancestors, every word that God had said to them, every action that their people had made, has had an effect on who they are today. Our history matters. It makes us who we are. Do we ever think that? It goes against the grain of American ethic, doesn't it? We are who we make ourselves, an army of one, right? Rugged individualism. And they confessed to God the sins and failures of their ancestors. They publicly grieved over the losses that their fathers had experienced because of those failures. Why? Why confess to something and grieve over something over which you had no control? You weren't even there. That you had no part of. Because it was part of their common history. It was their family. In families today, do we not grieve over the dramas and the tragedies of the people that we love? of those to whom we are connected. When one of us hurts, we all hurt. An English priest several hundred years ago wrote a poem called No Man is an Island, illustrating this very thought. Therefore, this is a quote, therefore do not send to know for whom the bell tolls, for it tolls for thee. The bell would ring when somebody died. So it doesn't matter if you knew him or not. We're all connected. We are each one affected by another person's grief or loss. We also see God's people reading from the instruction scroll. Do you have one of those? I do. Hold them up. There they are. Mine's right there. Or I hold it up. Well, I have a Bible in here too. Yeah, we each have one. It's Holy Scripture. It's our family story. The story of God's people. Reading from God's Word. This was their story. This is our story. We read Holy Scripture not just to learn the history of God's people, although this is where we begin to learn it when we read it, but also to read into God's story. Imagine Scripture as if you were reading a You Were There book. That's kind of dating me, but there used to be those books like you were there at, and they were kind of an interesting way to get kids to read history. Imagine you were there in the story that you're reading. How would you be affected by what's happening? What would you do? We tend to think, oh, I know, since we know the end of the story, right? I know what I would do. Do you? Really? This was them, but it's also us. God's people was not just them. God's people is also us. I can imagine the people as the story was recited, shouting and waving their hankies and running the aisles at all the promises and the deliverances of God and then hanging their heads in shame and weeping at the reminders of their sins and failures. And in verse 5, we read something a little bit unusual for us. The people are instructed to stand and bless God. That might seem a little backward to us. Blessing God. Do you ever play the remember when game? When you were together with good friends or people you haven't seen for a long time? Remember when? In my family, the remember game includes some favorite stories. The time when Grandpa sat in the chair and it broke an inch at a time, and we could see Grandpa going down like this behind the table. 
We still laugh when we think about it. The time when my stepsister almost shot her foot off in the desert. That's not a good one, but we remember it. The time Pamela got stuck in a tree when she was like five and my mother was pregnant and had to climb up there and get her out of the tree. When Grandpa was baptized in his 80s. This is what God's people are doing in Nehemiah chapter 9. They've gathered together. They have fasted. They have confessed their sins and grieved. They have read from the instruction scroll from the Lord their God, and then they begin to remember when. The religious leaders, the Levites, told the people to stand up and bless the Lord your God, verse 5. Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Bless your glorious name, which is high above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. And they continue. They list the wonderful and glorious things that God has done. All of creation. Verse 7. Lord God, you are the one who chose, who chose our people to be blessed. Verse 9. You saw the affliction. Verse 10, you performed signs and wonders. Verse 11, you divided the sea. Verse 13, you came down from Mount, upon Mount Sinai and gave them proper judgments and true instruction. Verse 15, when they were hungry, you gave them bread from heaven. When they were thirsty, you brought water out of the rock for them. Verse 20, you gave your good spirit to teach them. Verse 21, you kept them alive for 40 years. Verse 22, you gave them kingdoms and people. Verse 26, they were disobedient. Verse 27, therefore you handed them over to the power of their enemies. But when they cried out to you in their suffering, you heard. Because you are merciful, you gave them saviors. Verse 30, you were patient with them for many years and warned them by your spirit. Verse 32, now our God great and mighty and awesome God. You are the one who faithfully keeps the covenant. Verse 33, you have been just in all that has happened to us. You have acted faithfully and we have done wrong. Do you see that the remember when, the remembering list, is not just the memories that make us feel good, make us feel uplifted. We also remember the things that brought us down that have instructed us in the proper way to love and honor God. The blessing is to honor and glorify God, but it is also a vital, valuable reminder to us that we can get things wrong and suffer powerfully bad consequences. These reminders are a way of teaching people what to do and what not to do. They are a motivation to choose God's way and not the other ways. That brings us to the final part of God's people in worship. Commitment. Verse 38. Because of all this, we are making a firm agreement in writing with the names of our officials, our Levites, and our priests on the seal. Part of our worship is covenant. That's a fancy word for promise. God has also been eager to covenant with God's people, but the people, us, we, must be an active partner in covenant, committed, held accountable. Do you see the pattern here? Everything was done in community. There was no single person off by themselves doing this all alone. They were all together. None of this individuality or each person for themselves. Community, togetherness. We're all in it together for support and encouragement and accountability. So, why bother with liturgy, with the work of the people? Why? Everything we do has a shape. Everything we do has a structure to it. Why shouldn't we intentionally shape our worship? Patterns are helpful for us as we go through our daily lives. And why not use the pattern of God's people for the pattern that we worship in, with in liturgy? The work of the people. And now I'm asking Chuck to come up and help us. With a reading, we're going to read the 
136 psalms that Pastor Andy began. There's, there's a reading and a response. I will read the part of the pastor or the priest. If you look at Psalm 136 in your Bibles, you, uh, you'll see the pattern. And Chuck will be leading you in the response. Yes. Not a passive response to prayer, to reading, to scripture. The words will be on the screen for all of us. What? Oops. Psalm 136. I have the New Living Translation. I think I will go get the NIV so that I don't mix anybody up. You've heard the phrase, the devil's in the... Yep. Somebody forgot to put the marker to make slides for that song, and it wasn't the slide maker. Okay. Are you good? <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders. His love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights. His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. His love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them. His love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. His love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. His love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it. His love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness. His love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings. His love endures forever. And killed mighty kings. His love endures forever. Sion, king of the Amorites. His love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan. His love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance. His love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel. His love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Amen. You sounded like you weren't real excited about that, and I can understand why, because you got the same line over and over. But think of a beach ball. Where's the end of it? I was, I was hoping one of the kids wouldn't toss it into the, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, God's love endures forever. Don't get tired of saying that. It's true. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, liturgy, work of the people, be intentional. Music, words, shapes, sounds, memories. Remember when? For the sending this week, crisis care kits, we will be assembling them Wednesday. And uh, in an email newsletter that pastors and anybody who wants to receives, we had a, a little or a news article this week that our crisis care kids are being used in Equality, Texas to help some of the families, the Nazarene Church's their ministry. It really means something. 
it seems like, you know, a drop in the bucket, like we're trying to empty the ocean with a teaspoon. But when we assemble, when we gather the, the stuff and assemble the crisis care kits, imagine having your house burned down and have nothing left. And you get this bag that has toothbrush and toothpaste and a comb and a little toy and hand towels. And you had nothing. It, is, it means something. So we'll, we'll be assembling those this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock p.m. And we're going to pray for Pastor Bob as he leads a group of young men to camp this week. That lives will be changed and everybody will be kept safe. And now prepare to receive the benediction, the good word from God. This is part of our liturgy, isn't it? The going out. We leave here to serve. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Well, if you're able, would you stand with us as we, we pray to the Lord one last time before we head out of here? And we talk where we, uh, God is our friend. Uh, Jesus is our, is our friend who sticks closer than a brother. And uh, 